Hi, it's Marco from Moose Marketing and PR, the editor of Punchline magazine. Welcome to a very special edition of Punchline Talks. Today we've got a, a distinguished guest uh, from the events industry, wedding and events industry. And let's be honest, this has been one of the industries that have been absolutely devastated with COVID-19. And it feels like it is one of the lost, left behind industry as well. And if it's something isn't done very shortly, I just don't think there's going to be an industry left. So we've got a panel of, of people that we'd like to bring on and, and, and have a chat. And I'm very, very delighted also today to have Sir Geoffrey Clifford Brown. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. MP for the Cotswolds and, and Councillor Dawn Melville as well. Dawn, we'd like to put your camera on. She's, she's... Unfor unfortunately, I can't do both at the moment because of Giga Clear. Okay. So you can have no, me speaking you... or see me. <laughs> We, we won't go into giga care today. That's a different debate. <laughs> when an industry, I believe, is worth something like 14.5 billion pounds, it employs vast amounts of people in different industries and, and the demographics as well. You know, it's not just young people that work in waitressing or weddings, but it's right across the board from flower industries to photographers. So I'd like, very much like to introduce Danny. Um, Danny, welcome to uh, Punchline Talks. Could you give us an overview, please, of where, where we're at? Yeah, um, certainly. Thank you so much for organising this call, Mark, and having us to talk to you um, and for the introduction. I think um, the point I'd like to start with is that um, calculations have been made that actually the, the wider events industry is worth £80 billion a year in revenue to the UK. So many of the suppliers who are on this call are um, wedding oriented and others of us do what may be called life cycle yeah. events. So um, birthdays and other celebrations as well as weddings. And then if you move into exhibitions, conferences, sporting events, um, many of us work in all of those as well. That's where we get to the 80 billion figure. So this is by no means a small industry when you compare it to some of the other figures being bandied around. And to your, to your point that this industry uh, supports people across all demographics. I think you'll find in talking to the people on this call that very many of us are entrepreneurs. Um, we run our own businesses um, and for um, reasons that we probably don't need to go into in detail today, many of us have fallen between every possible gap in terms of help and support. And we work in seasonal businesses. So our main earnings window is roughly from sort of March to October. And that's been completely decimated in 2020 and we're at risk of that being the case again for 2021, unless we can get into conversation with our consumers and give them the confidence to inspire bookings for next year. Um, many of us are hitting some serious kind of cash flow issues. Um, and we're here today to talk about possible solutions, how we can get back to work, how we can give our consumers confidence and save a valuable industry in our county. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. I think you've put that perfectly across really and, and how devastating this, this COVID has been to your industry. Uh, like, let me very quickly bring in um, Talitha Nelson, the CEO of the uh, Foundation Trust here in Gloucestershire. Talitha, would you like to um, come in and um, say a few words, please? Morning, everyone. Thank you, Mark, for hosting this. And I'm so pleased we've got some political ear on board as well with Sir Geoffrey and Dawn Melvin. Really appreciate you both turning up um, because actually I've just loaded this report for everybody to have a look at. So I run the Gloucestershire Community Foundation. We've been providing support to community groups and charities for 30 years. Um, I'm also a co-founder of an events business, so I'm very aware of what's been happening in events. I'm just fortunate that I have a day job. Um, but what was apparent as a, a charity and a third sector is we stepped up really quickly to have a voice and start working for our communities. But in the background, um, our, our events industry was very silent and being totally forgotten. And I could see the stark contrast between sectors. Um, I started getting some personal messages from friends in the sector that that alarmed me. Um, and then this report hit my desk and this report basically on page 23, figure 13. If you have a look, um, we're one of nine counties most vulnerable to COVID in the whole of the country. So one of nine, Gloucestershire pops up, which actually everybody thinks Gloucestershire is a really affluent county. And having been cited on this report as being one of nine counties most vulnerable to COVID, um, the reasons being is the high reliance on hospitality, events and tourism. 
Um, and then it went through to a lot of my work around young people and unemployment. I've just got off a multi-agency meeting with the high sheriff and someone's just presented um, from the CCG, the figures of young people and unemployment, which is starkly risen. Um, and so we've got this real issue between our sector that's forgotten, which does hold up much of our community employment, both in rural communities and urban areas. Um, and the knock-on is onto young people, which are now so disadvantaged and not getting their first opportunity in jobs, which is what this sector provides, and the isolation and loneliness within rural communities and very little opportunity, which this sector also provides. So this was my reason to really try and think about how business community sits with the third sector, because essentially when unemployment goes up and when our county is most vulnerable, it hits my charities and need goes up. And that's the area that I have to think about supporting in terms of money and support. The whole of our county is interconnected. So how do we work together? So really delighted that I can um, have this conversation today and I'll hand it over. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Talitha. First of all, I'd like to bring in a wedding planner um, from Sorry Design, is that how you say it? And uh, hashtag what about weddings, family spokesperson, Jesse Westwood. Jesse, would you like to uh, come forward, please, and say a few words? I know that um, you've done a fantastic job of trying to get this across and trying to get the message and champion it, spend a lot of time and energy on it. Would you like yeah. to come forward, please? Thank you. Hi, uh, yeah, I run, it's Studio Sororas. It's um, a planning design and business. I've been doing it for 10 years. Um, when COVID hit, um, I quickly had a quick ring round of all the people that were sort of influencers or fairly senior within our sector and predicted this would be a major issue for us in terms of working long-term. I was under no false solutions. It was going away quickly. We put together the What About Weddings campaign very much as a function to support the industry, but also couples um, to give them a voice um, and to listen to what their needs were um, and what we could do to support them. It's evolved hugely over the last nine months. Um, I've actually just come from a round table with the various industry associations and bodies that represent the different parts of our sector. Um, and it is a fairly worrying time to say the least. Um, it is at a critical point for many. Uh, we have a huge mix, as I think Danny touched upon, in terms of types of businesses. Um, many are employers who are facing mass redundancies. Um, they simply cannot maintain their business and costs without support directly to them as a business. Venues are closing. I think the current list with the venue support group, there's about 50 uh, venues who are immediately at risk and many closing in the last two weeks um, there have been three companies I've known that have gone into administration um, you then trickle that down to the self-employed um, the small limited company directors the SMEs that are one-man bands um, and the struggles that they are facing and again Danny touched a point it, you know, a lot of people just have not received anything um, and the issues that we face are not only a year's worth of work gone, so a year's worth of revenue for pretty much any, any business is hard to, to deal with, but the fact that we are now facing next season, um, which we have had all of our work deferred, particularly in the wedding industry itself to next year or beyond, um, the work's not gone, it's there waiting. We have contractual commitments to them. It's not that easy to just go and get another job when you have that hanging over you and the vast amount of admin that we take on board in, in rearranging every time there's another announcement. Um, and instead of every bit of good news, um, consumer confidence lifts a little bit. And then when we have restricted guidelines announced again, it, it dips. And we're now seeing people move um, their dates from next year further ahead or canceling altogether. And we're seeing almost a complete dry up of new inquiries altogether. So cash flow is a real issue, but we still have contractual commitments. There's normally over 250,000 couples a year who get married. Um, I think by October, we'd lost 80% of that. Absolutely. Thank you ever so much. Um, and it must be tremendously upsetting. Let's be honest. Uh, you know, when you, I've been working in, a, in, in um, you know, running my own business for 20 years, running an advertising agency for 20 years. And when people lose a business, it's their baby. We're not just talking about we're not just talking about jobs, are we? We're talking about something that they've created and built over the years, and 
and it, it's 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 money, it's marriages, it, the knock on effect is yeah, is it's a huge, there is a huge, huge mental health crisis within our sector. People yeah. feel like they're not worthy, that they've not been consideration, that we're not mentioned in a lot of the updates in line with some of the other sectors, that we have been forgotten. Um, we did host a number of mental health um, sort of meetings with anybody who wanted to join. Um, and in fact, um, one of the people who ran that, we had to shut the meeting early because they got so upset listening to the stories. Um, it's also a predominantly female led sector. Um, we know from our surveys that 85% of businesses are owned by women. Many of them are also juggling their families, have dealt with lockdown and homeschooling commitments or lack of childcare, um, and are worried about how they're going to keep an income coming through, maintain all of their clients that they have these commitments to moving forward um, and, and sort of move through the next. It's going to be a very, very difficult winter period for a lot of people. Well, let's if I, if, Mark, if I could just yeah. jump in on the on the mental health aspects, and um, and I'm sure everybody agrees with what Jesse's been saying. Many of us were spoken for there. I think one of the one of the broader issues that makes one feel so forgotten is the total lack of parity between our industry and other industries. And we watched in the summer um, the the eat out to help out schemes, pubs and restaurants opening and. I know it's been talked a lot about before, but crowds of people outside pubs in central cities. And we're all seasoned professionals who are capable of gathering groups of people who want to celebrate um, together safely. I think we've all realized that there needs to be a compromise in the way that our events work for the time being. You know, maybe there's no singing and no dancing, for example, no shouting, but there can be seated meals. And um, we're not idiots. We are able to organize events in private venues. Um, if marquees were allowed to operate, you know, there's so many of us in this sector that are willing to take responsibility for operating safely. And there's been no data to suggest that our sorts of environments are any more infectious than somewhere like a pub or a restaurant where you can give a false name and phone number compared to our sector where everybody invited is known and able to be tracked and traced. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. I'd just like to go back to Jesse very quickly, Jesse. One of the things that you said is that you feel alone. And uh, the nice thing is, is that you're not alone. Today, you have 20 other people here on the call, all champion the cause, you know, and working together. We get that message out there. Uh, if we can try and persuade someone like Sir Jeffrey, who's kind of come along and, and dawn and champion that corner and spread the word a bit better, then hopefully you won't feel so alone. I think these things yeah. really, really help. Um, yeah. I'd like to, if that's okay, move on to Natasha Russell. Natasha is an event manager and coordinator of Cheltenham's, uh, I can't remember, I've took my glasses off, of Cheltenham's campaign. We make events campaign. I'm very sorry, I couldn't read it. Natasha, no you Yes, yeah, I am. So yeah, I took on um, leading the We Make Events campaign for Cheltenham slash Gloucestershire earlier about August um, so I'm still very much on board with the campaign um, but echo what the others are saying really um, you know obviously <coughs> excuse me um, I work in a slightly different sector in that I do festival sports events and large corporate events um, totally appreciate they couldn't go ahead but as everyone says if if we can't do it safely, then who can? And the lack of consistency across the messaging is um, quite worrying. You know, football stadiums can go back, but that isn't, you know, it's not financially viable for a stadium gig or for a festival to go back at that reduced capacity. And um, also echoing um, the mental health things. I, I was really shocked. It, it hit me that I felt like I'd lost my sense of worth, that that makes sense. I thought I was quite alone and being quite female about it. And actually at the last We Make Events campaign, um, we had some videos made with various people that were at the protest um, on the 30th of September in Cheltenham. And, you know, I have all those videos and every single one of them, and actually most of the others are male. Um, said exactly the same they feel lost they've lost their family they've lost 
their sense of purpose they've lost any direction you know that's whether they're employed and on furlough whether they're self-employed whatever situation I think in events we work very much away from home often we work very long hours um we're extremely dedicated to our jobs we just we have to be because of the hours and the people you are working with become your your friends and family and yeah the the loss of that is quite quite huge. Natasha can I ask you what's the, been the the actual effect on the business itself monetary wise how much money have you lost if you don't mind me or, or business is it 95 percent down is it completely gone everything? All my live work stopped the day lockdown was announced everything got cancelled my have a huge live event usually in January that's been pushed to May but it may get cancelled or go virtual um I have a huge event usually every March that is not happening at all I would usually have a contract in place by now for several festivals next year none of them have come through so I mean my wall plan is behind me <laughs> yeah this tells me to re-register my company and it's pretty much the only thing on the calendar do you think your, co your company will survive I work really hard to I'm trying very hard to establish myself in the virtual space but you know there's just not the confidence not everybody or not every event can transition to a virtual environment not everyone has the skills to do that um you know I consider myself lucky I really enjoy the technological side technology side of things so I'm trying really hard but you know I'm a one person company um I can't do everything and so yeah trying really hard to survive but we need to know we just need a roadmap and we okay. need the support uh, you know like the others have said before me so many of us fall between the cracks we work at home or we're directors of limited companies we can't furlough ourselves we're not eligible for grants because we don't have business rates yes. yet we still have to pay all those business expenses we just pay them in our own homes I mean, I'd like to touch with Sir Geoffrey afterwards about that, actually, about limited company directorship, because I'm one of those. Thank you ever so much, by the way. But, um, I'd like to turn now to Ruth Hunter. Ruth, um, a wedding industry award photographer, a stylist, sorry. Style of phone, a phone reader? Is that how you say? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, yeah, so this is Hi. Kim as well. So we're business partners. And uh, so we've, we've like, I've been in the wedding industry since 2007. Um, we've worked incredibly hard over the last eight years to build up our award-winning styling company. And as direct, so we're a limited company. Um, so we are directors. And I think the first thing to, sorry, my dog just wants to join in and it's kind of shame. Okay. Um, the more the merrier, yeah. <laughs> bless him. Always perfect timing, isn't it? Um, I think the first thing that we want, that, that we've noticed as directors of a company is the unfairness with regards to the um, the payments that we've been able to receive, uh, and other if any of you are um, directors of your own companies as well, you'll understand that you only receive the furlough pay of eighty percent of your basic wage, which is the, the way that you work your tax allowances out. So obviously it's up to twelve thousand pounds. So we've gone from earning you know about forty to fifty thousand pounds a year each. Yep. to being able to claim literally 80% of a basic taxpayer's wage. We have one employer, uh, one employee, our office manager, she actually receives more money yep. than us on furlough. Yes. Now, we had received the, the grant because we, we do have small business tax rates relief. However, we are also one of the only industries, and this is what this hasn't necessarily been covered yet, we are also one of the only industries, I think, other than maybe childcare, where we are being made to repay money. So not only as a company, we've lost over £100,000 this year. We've earned maybe less than £20,000. Out of that money, and out of the money that we've got as our £10,000 grant, we've had to continue to pay our rent on our offices. We have indemnity insurance, we have van costs, we have other we have other costs each month, which equate to hundreds of pounds. And then we've also been told by the CMA that we have got to repay minus reasonable costs, which when you haven't actually done much of the work, there's not much that they, we can actually hold back. 
um, we've had to pay back deposits. <laughs> and now they want to play, sorry. Okay. Um, and that's been crippling. Like, we've paid back thousands of pounds as well as not earning. And we just need to have some understanding from the government. We need protection. Um, I believe that there that it is now being taken to, um, to some legal action to see whether or not the CMA report was actually legal, because there was actually no, I believe there was no uh, discussion with the industry as to what effect that would have on us, et cetera, et cetera. So from our point of view at the moment, we need protection. We need to have an understanding of where we sit with regards to the money that we're expected to pay back. Okay, can I ask you, how, how long do you, you think your business can hold out before... You, you have to fold, you have to call it a day. We are in a bit more of a luxurious position in the sense we own all our own stock. Um, we may have to potentially move our, our office into our own homes again and, and try and store our stock and reduce our stock. Um, we don't have any liability on our, on our business. We don't own any money. We never have. And we've always made, our, made sure we've been in that position. We've never had debt. Um, but so I think even in that position, people have to understand that there is a limit of, you know, we're not talking years. There are there is a set amount of time before we literally not earning money will have to call it a day. And it's in so many businesses like ours that are successful are going to end up going into administration and closing the doors. And my biggest issue is next year we've been told we've moved all these weddings a lot of these weddings have to be moved for free or for a very small amount of increase to cover the additional costs, which is booked out all of our prime dates or and beyond, which means we can't take new bookings. So not only are we fighting a fire financially this year, we absolutely cannot earn enough money next year. There's no support and help for us. We, we've lost all these dates. We're dealing with very upset brides and grooms. Understandably, it's their wedding day, but there are only so many days in the year. So next year is already a financial disaster for us. We know this. This isn't like, that's not like a project. That's a forecast. That's a fact. So it's going to be incredibly, incredibly difficult for us as an industry. But in response to your, in reply to your question, we have no idea. We're literally going month by month. Okay. One of the things I'd just like to point this out to Sir Jeffrey, just very quickly, and then I'll bring in Jessie um, uh, back. I think she'd like to say something. Um, that is that G First LEP is doing a brilliant job, by the way. You can actually get, if you start, if you were starting a new business, you can get some funding. They could start a business that you guys are in, and they'd get funding to start that business because they're helping unemployed. And yet you got you guys have a viable business, a successful yeah. business, successful entrepreneurs, and, the, and it appears that the government is quite willing to sort of let that fall through its fingertips rather than, and then try and spend an absolute fortune starting a new business. That's my own personal view on it. Uh, Jesse, would you like to bring on something? Yeah, something to say. yeah I just wanted to touch upon the, the CMA and the refunds. One of the biggest issues we have had across the sector, and I don't think there's any business that has not had this problem um, is that couples have not been able to claim on wedding insurance um, bar one that I know of who has been seeking to recoup that money directly from suppliers when they've paid out business interruption has not paid out um, and the CMA exactly as Ruth pointed out before have been quite aggressively suggesting that all businesses and suppliers, if there was a wedding that was cancelled within sort of the main COVID period from March to July, um, would have to force through a refund. That was challenged. Um, there is a company called Bijou Weddings who are at the forefront of all of this. Um, and they came back to say that reasonable costs could be kept at a much higher level. But the problem remains that there are people who cannot claim on their wedding insurance who've had to postpone or cancel their wedding. There are businesses who cannot claim on business interruption insurance and forward thinking because, you know, on the positive side, we do have deferred work ready and waiting. I think something like two billion would be released within six months of us reopening. So there is a recovery period waiting for us. Unfortunately, because the insurance issue has not been solved, the confidence of consumers booking things in for sort of 2022, 2023, which would be beyond recovery into sort of getting, getting more income and cash flow coming through is prevented. Um, and it is a really big, big, big problem across the event sector is that we do not have insurance for big events, small events, weddings available to us. 
um, and how we manage that risk as businesses, as consumers, is, is a question that needs to be answered. It's um, something, if I can just jump in, something the We Make Events campaign are asking for is a government-backed insurance scheme so that there's um, confidence because on top of um, what's been said there about weddings and wedding insurance, there's also um, organisers are just really reluctant to go ahead because they risk losing a lot of money. So they can't get sponsors because sponsors don't have confidence and it's that consumer confidence is being knocked on and on. Um, and one of my clients actually put a survey out to their members who said the way things stood, this was about a month ago, they wouldn't be comfortable to go to an in-person live event until quarter three, 2021. That was before this current lockdown. So obviously every lockdown and every, every, um, everything basically that happens that sets us back in this COVID journey sets back consumer confidence. So it's across all sectors um, and, and employers won't send their staff to conferences. They're not comfortable to do that because obviously then there's a knock on on their industry. So the insurance thing is a really massive issue. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn attention to uh, um, to Tiger in the Tail, Jess Burling. Jess, um, would you like to say something, please, about your business? Hi there. Um, so uh, I'm a wedding florist based in the Cotswolds. Um, I've been, well, I'm relatively new. I've been going since 2017. Previously, um, I worked in the creative marketing, marketing industry. Um, and uh, I'm actually also um, a bride. I was meant to be getting married myself this year. So it's been quite interesting for me seeing it from both sides as a supplier and also as, a, um, as somebody who's meant to be getting married. Um, in terms of my calendar, so I had um, about 32 weddings booked for the year. The first one was meant to go ahead the weekend um, after lockdown started. Um, to date, I have delivered one micro wedding in July, which was um, one of my, as soon as the restrictions were lifted, one of my couples who were meant to be getting married decided to go ahead and had a church ceremony with um, four members of their family. Um, and oh, What was that worth? Uh, under a thousand pounds. So uh, since then, in terms of wedding work, I've had none whatsoever. Um, I'm in a very privileged position in that my uh, partner, who's also self-employed, um, his business has been able to be operational throughout, um, which to be honest is a complete fluke. We didn't think that he would be able to continue working, but he was, and he has been um, funding me basically. So um, from a kind of psychological perspective, point of view from a mental health point of view obviously it's um absolutely crushing <laughs> to not be able to support myself financially support my business to be reliant on somebody else even though that money is obviously given willingly by him it's not the point <laughs> I want to be able to just um have my no, business good. and del deliver the work exactly um so uh in terms of um our, our own wedding two of our suppliers have gone into administration last week um, we have absolutely no idea if that's money that we can recoup. Um, we've lost about kind of three thousand pounds in deposits, um, which, bizarrely, I kind of, <laughs> um, as somebody getting married, my heart completely goes out to the suppliers because, especially in one of the businesses, it was a family-run business. Um, their life and soul have been put into it, and I know that one of the co-owners, I mean, is literally having a breakdown over it and I just think it's awful so the money for us is kind of like just another thing that we have to have to deal with it's really kind of the impact seeing the impact on people's on people's livelihoods um, and yeah in terms of my business just echoing what everyone else has said I think the CMA issue was hugely hugely damaging and again I was very lucky that I had a good relationship with my couples where we were able to kind of come to agreements um, but that was purely based on the relationship we had and us being able to talk things through um, otherwise I could have been having to hand back huge amounts of money which I didn't have because obviously those deposits are, par are, par are partially spent and 
running costs of the business. So um, yeah, the CMA guidelines initially were, 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 were hugely damaging and just this huge lack of consumer confidence for 2021. I mean, I've hardly got all, all of my work for next year. I would say it's, it's 90% deferred from 2020. The um, new inquiries are so thin on the ground. So there's really no fresh income for next year, which is obviously incredibly worrying as well. So it's just a very, um, it's a very scary time. And I think that at the beginning of lockdown, everyone kind of felt like, okay, we've just got to get through this for a few months and we can do it. And it was all very positive. And I think um, now it's, um, it's just a terrifying reality that this is, you know, a, a year of income lost plus for so many people. Um, I'm kind of asking all of you the same question. I hope you all don't think I'm being rude here because I've been in the same position with my own company and this all kicked off. I was thinking, my goodness, how are we going to see our way through this? You know, people started cancelling their advertising and cancelled the magazine we put together, everything. And it's very difficult. So how long, Jess, do you think you can hang on with your business or thankfully your partner is quite <laughs> yeah as long as my as long as my partner gets, which you know as well I think as I said he was able to work um throughout the, the majority of this year but business has really started slowing for him in the last two months mm. so that in itself is also quite worrying um and it's just I feel like you know as a self but 2020 as a self-employed person I felt a huge um what's the word um i suppose you have this sense of you know um you've got a great purpose and you can really go out there and achieve and you can really make what you want out of your career and you don't have to be um kind of curtailed by anything you know if you if you can dream it you can do it and that's the beauty of being self-employed and i loved that 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 aspect of, of my job now it feels that being self-employed is just you're just waiting <laughs> Yes. Uh, your, your, your self-esteem gets damaged, doesn't it? Sorry. Your self-esteem gets damaged. Completely. And, and your confidence. And you know, and, and that that constant worry in your lying in the bed at night, worried. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the other thing I just wanted to say, as so I'll just quickly on the weddings, is that I think one of the main issues for a lot of suppliers is this number. So this, you know, 15 people, which then went to 30 people, which then went to 15 people. And I think I know that a lot of the the government's reaction had been, well, you know, weddings were allowed to go ahead. And the reality is that A, these numbers feel really nonsensical and there seems to be no evidence or logical reasoning behind, behind the numbers that are allowed. But B, that for many suppliers, a wedding of that size, it's not viable to keep our businesses going. You know, we need to be able to be delivering full scale weddings, obviously in a safe and secure way. But in order to in order to keep us going, you know, fifteen person wedding, the work that that sends our way is just it's not enough. Yeah, it's, you can't you can't make a business out of that, isn't it? It's not it's not pers it's not viable. Okay, I'm going to uh, thank you ever so much, Jess. I know that must be difficult. I'm very sorry to hear about your wedding, your own personal wedding as well, as we say, as we all are here. Um, let's go to wedding photographer Laura uh, Martha. Laura, are you there? Is Laura here today? No, okay. Don't worry. We'll uh, we'll we'll move swiftly on then. Um, let's let's talk to uh, Jules. Jules Magnus, recently graduated events management student. Are you yes. There, Jules? Hi. Hi. Hi there. Let me just put you as a as the main speaker. Hello there. Hello. You said, you, said you were one of the first person that, that that came on actually. Yes. Um, this morning. Anyway, so um, so you're 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 a student graduated events management student. So what's it been like for you, George? You must have had this, sorry to put words in your mouth, I don't mean to, but this dream of working in the industry. Yeah, I mean, when you spend um, three years kind of working for a degree um, and then suddenly leave uni and kind of feel like you've got your whole career ahead of you and getting really excited for it, um, it's obviously not the most ideal situation to be in, um, but, you know, events have always been a way for me to kind of support myself throughout my uni career, even before uni, like there's been a way of kind of independence and kind of job opportunity, like Tally said. Um, 
and you know obviously getting this uni degree was great because I was really pursuing something that I love doing and you know because it is such a fun industry to be in you're making people so happy and like no day is the same it's so kind of different each time um and so I think this year has just been equally as weird as frustrating as I'm sure everyone can kind of agree and you know very very upsetting um but kind of from my perspective, in terms of this whole COVID thing, I've missed out on, you know, starting a career, you know, making contacts to kind of further, um, further my career. Um, and, you know, also kind of, I started an internship in London um, for a music festival agency five days before lockdown was announced. So I was couch surfing in London. I was going for house viewings in the evening, didn't find anywhere and then had to come home and get a change of clothes. And I was ready packed to go back to London on the Sunday evening. And it was basically like, no, don't bother coming back in. Um, so I've been sent home since March, which I'm very fortunate. Like I feel fortunate about because I'm safe and, you know, I'm very lucky that I've got parents that can kind of support me and we all kind of muck in to do our bit. Um, I've been cleaning Airbnbs and I started sewing scrubs for the NHS so I was doing things to keep me busy but I just had this actual lack of purpose that I wasn't really doing what I wanted to do um, and just kind of mirroring what Tally said about you know Gloucestershire is a very kind of rural area and the the kind of scope for opportunity for young people isn't as big as if you know we were in London or anything um, so yeah it's just been a bit problematic and my heart goes out to people with businesses because you know I think in recent months looking at the news and hearing about people's personal stories it just you know highlights how big this kind of events ecosystem is and there are so many um, businesses, artists, caterers, organisers, all these people that make it an ecosystem that it is. We're all reliant on each other and it's getting to the point now where it's like you know there might, there might not be this ecosystem next year so yeah i just feel really really bad for everyone to be honest a lot of young people get you know this is their first opportunity to, to to work both my daughters work for a catering company doing weddings waitressing yeah you know and, and given that opportunity washing dishes that 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 thing you all need don't you to to, to actually learn about hard work yeah it's really important um and yeah it's just it's completely kind of gone for the time being. Thank you ever so much, Jules. Really, really appreciate that. No um, let's go on to, uh, to, to Matt. Matt Fenton, can you come um, on screen, please? Hello, Matt. Oh. So can, you, can you tell me a bit about a bit about your business, where it was before COVID? OK, you know, a brief, a brief description of the company. If you don't yep. mind, also the turnover and then what's happened and where we are now and the future. Yeah. So we're, we're slightly different from most of the people on the call. We're barely involved in the wedding industry, um, just little bits. Uh, but we do uh, supply staff and technical support to pretty much the rest of the events industry. So corporate, conference, um, exhibition, experiential, um, live events, live music, festivals, venues. So that, that ironically, everything but weddings pretty much. Um, We've been going since 99. Um, we are turning over now this year about 6%. So we've lost about 94% turnover, which is about 750,000 for us. Um, and yeah, my job for the summer mostly has been making people redundant, sadly. Uh, Some of these guys work for you a long time then? Uh, yeah, yeah, some people, it varies. Most of our guys are with us three to five years. I mean, people vary. People have key jobs that they like to do. We have some people who come back every year and do the same festival. They love doing property or they love doing 2000 trees or whatever it might be. And they come and do the same job in the same place. And then you don't really see them again for the rest of the year. Equally, we've got people who it's, it's their career, you know, um, and sadly, We've had to sort of frittered away over the over the course of the year. How did you um, how did you decide, or when did you decide to let these guys go? Because obviously there's a chance of maybe they couldn't be furloughed because they're part time, or uh, yeah. So, 
it, it varies really. Some of some of our guys, um, I mean, everything came on so quickly, <clears throat> as people on here will know. We were still recruiting in February and into March. <laughs> so ironically, we had people who didn't qualify for furlough with us and equally didn't qualify with their previous employer. Um, so we, we had to carry on paying, paying them for a while um, and, and just couldn't sustain that beyond sort of midsummer. Um, equally, the, fur the furlough scheme's been brilliant, don't get me wrong. Um, a lot of people have, a lot of our staff have made a, a chunk of money that they wouldn't have otherwise had. Um, but it's, it's thrown together. I don't think anybody can dispute that it's, you know, has to have been thrown together at the last minute and it's, it's not consistent. So we came out of the furlough scheme once, once our costs started to bite, you know, um, and then eventually went to redundancies the last round in October, uh, ironically, three days after the redundancy payments went through the furlough scheme kicked back in again. Yeah. Um, but again, there's no certainty for employers. The furlough scheme is currently fully funded by the government and seems to be fully funded into December. And then there's huge question marks after that. If it continues at what level of funding um, and bringing people back is, is problematic and uh, has different, hit different rules in under the new scheme. Should it be problematic as well on an emotional scale? Have you had to let somebody go? And then try and bring them, and they know you've let them go. Mm -hmm. Why would they want to work with you again? <laughs> yeah, no, because uh, you know, there is that, isn't it? That, that emotional side. I think it's important that that people understand that that element. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're we're still a fairly small company, uh, bigger than some of the people on the call. I think around eighty employees at the beginning of this, um, but you still know all these people personally. Yeah. Um, and you try and maintain some kind of relationship. And I, I think, you know, that will maintain and, and potentially some people will come back, but equally some people won't through circumstances. They, they have other, other jobs or other careers by then, or as you say, they've been let down once and, and they won't come back. So it's a tough question. I'm going to ask you, how many people did you employ? Uh, we were around 80 at the beginning. Um, most of those are on zero hour contracts because it's entirely flexible um, and seven uh, full time contracted. So you had a, you, 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 you've lost 94% of your business. Is that just 750,000? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and how do you see that, see it moving forward? How long can you go? How long? Obviously, you've got a nice office there. I can see it behind you. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, in it, I'm in it on my own. I insist on coming in. Yeah. Um, uh, cash flow wise we run out in the next couple of weeks and then we're into borrowings yep. um, we luckily have come off the back of three or four good years yep. we're fairly profitable um, and so we've been living off that um, but that's gone pretty much um, we're very seasonal like everybody else even though we're spread across the different industries our December is is, is half a month like everybody normally uh, and January and February we make a loss in a good year so yeah. uh, that's not going to help us um, the issues for us probably will be looking into April May June when we should be ramping up rapidly and then July August September where we should be at capacity um, I can see a few issues firstly we're we're not there this year um, as in the um, bookings are not coming in either because in a lot of cases most of our clients are still on furlough so they're not able to discuss things even if they want to um, plus the the uncertainties that everybody else has talked about of you know would you be starting a new festival this July probably not um, and my my other worry which I think will affect all of us massively is when it comes back whenever that is we will all be struggling for capacity yeah you know if if thousands of staff have been laid off and gone to do other things they may or may not be able to come back at the drop of a hat and you will have key weekends there's only so many weekends in july you will have key weekends that need hundreds of thousands of staff and we, they don't exist anymore 
we had this in the last recession where um, you know the builders stopped building and they couldn't find bricklayers anymore. In fact, they ran out of bricks and stopped making bricks. Um, Matt, thank you ever so much for being so honest. And um, you know, my heart goes out. I'm sure all of us say, if I, if I was in the room there, I'd give you a hug, mate. Um, I, can, I can, can't imagine how difficult it is. I've had to make people redundant, and I know how difficult it is on, a, on an emotional scale, you know, mate. So, uh, all, the, all the very best to that. So, um, please stay around, hang around. Let's, let, let's, uh, if you don't mind, we'll move on to Ross next. I'm kind of running out of time as well. So, uh, and of course, I definitely just want to get over to Jeffrey and to Dawn as well. Uh, we've still got plenty of time to have their chat as well. But so, Ross, can I have a quick word of you, please? You're the, the director of the club at Tuffley Park uh, and the owner of Generation Events. Has this been a similar situation for you? Thanks, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, probably two of the worst businesses to have um, during the, this time. 2020 was going to be our biggest year. Um, we sort of do around sort of 350 weddings a year on average. Um, Obviously, that hasn't happened this year. A lot of the work's deferred to next year, but we have the same issue. Whereas next year, if everything is due to be planned to go ahead, as well as what we already had in with over 500 weddings, um, obviously, capacity is an issue. Um, unfortunately, last year, I left my, my full-time job uh, in the police service um, to continue growing the businesses. Um, I'm a family-run business. Me and my wife are both the directors of both of the of the businesses. The club at Tuffley Park. We um, we started that last May with a hundred thousand pounds investment, which um, is has been from how we've grown Generation Events. So our savings effectively went into our new business. So it's been very very tough. Yeah, and uh, I'm assuming it's a limited company as well. Yeah, limited company. Both directors. So you get, you get. Yeah, and it has a knock-on effect with all our suppliers as well. Um, our subcontractors, our, our, our DJs, a, a team of, of 15 DJs who, who rely on us for their income. Um, obviously, we've not been able to provide them with work. So, it, yes, yeah, it's, it's been been horrible. And we still got the costs. We've got warehouse. Um, we, we have all the vans. We have the insurances. All those still need to be paid. And, and I'm assuming the, the £100,000 investment... That's all your life savings, so there's not a lot of meat left on the bone. No, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and and the, the club um, for, for its um, first year was was doing very well. Um, and we were moving into to, 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 to the weddings, the weddings that we had booked in to go ahead this year um, didn't go ahead. Um, so that was money that we had to, uh, planned to come back into the businesses. Whereabouts is Tuffy Park? Uh, it's um, on Tuffley Avenue in Gloucester. It used to be the Wagon Works Sports and Social Club. Um, it was a very run-down building, and we brought it back to life. Um, and it was it, we've had a lot of support from our community um, people coming to to visit us. But um, yeah, it's it's difficult because even now we don't know until tomorrow um, if we're able to reopen. Because um, if we're into tier two, um, we won't even be able to open the bar just to see us through. Yeah, I, I have seen your investment there. Mate. So, um, yeah, you've done a cracking, a cracking job. I live near quite close to you. Oh, lovely. I won't say where I live because it's an open forum. So, we'll, we'll <laughs> take that. Um, I just okay. want to cut in. I'm just mindful yeah. of time because we've got yeah. um, Richard Parsons, who we've not heard from, and Faye, but most importantly, also afterwards, that we will talk about the solutions. I think it's going to be really, really important. Um, that, uh, I'm, that I'm just about politically just... has some of that. Um, and right, just to so butt in too, I, I, I was sort of booked in for an hour and I've got a, you know... All right, uh, okay, let's, let's pass it over to you then, sir. We'll go, we'll go straight to Sir, Sir, Sir Jeffrey. Thank you ever so much well, for today, by the way. Hopefully you've got a lot of feedback there. Well, absolutely, Mark. I'm, I'm sorry to, to, to hurry you. Um, and uh, these are all heart-rending stories. I've been doing what you're doing now for weeks and weeks and weeks uh, barn, at the Barn Theatre in Sirencester, having a panel of people on various different topics. So I absolutely understand uh, the tourist industry. Um, I was there at the ground floor arguing for various support for the tourist industry, and we managed, I think, to get quite a lot of support for um, business interruption loans, for uh, various grants, which have helped 
some sectors, such as the bed and breakfast sectors, these sorts of sectors, property related sectors, got some business interruption grants quite early on. But what I'm hearing today is, uh, which of course I've already had representations on, is the wedding industry. It has been in, in every sort of related way from all the businesses you've got on today, from flowers to staff suppliers to events planners. Uh, it has been hit really hard and, and, and I can't tell you how much that grieves me. It really does. And um, the, the government is understandably struggling with this because they've paid out a huge amount of money and they're not going to be able to help every person in every situation, understandably. But what I'm hearing today is that I think some businesses may be able to carry on. And what I've been urging the government to do is to have a risk-based approach to every business that they're closing. And if I don't see any reason why if pubs can open to serve meals on a socially distanced way, why this shouldn't be able to be done in a marquee. I really can't understand why not. I suppose the only difference in a pub and perhaps a marquee is the licensing system. I don't know but surely we can come up with a way. So I've made a lot of notes today uh, and I feel absolutely gutted on all your behalf. So I can't tell you I really do. All of you who've worked so hard, built up savings uh, and likely now to lose those savings, absolutely gutted. And people who are gonna lose their jobs, a young graduate there who has worked hard at uni for three years, not even got started. So I've taken it, I'll take it all away. I'll put it all to government. I'll see what further help might be possibly available because I can see the wedding industry is a particular category that has been really hard hit. Um, uh, and, and let's just see if the government can find any help for your industry. Um, I, the only thing I would say is, and this is just, I mean, I'm, in, I'm involved in the periphery of this business because my family is involved in holiday uh, businesses. So I'm involved in the per periphery of this business and my business or family business has been hit hard as well. Um, uh, uh, the only thing I would say is, uh, see how you can lock the business down, pe pe cut, cut any unnecessary costs out, whatever that means, and just batten down the hatches and see if you can survive and I know not everybody will survive, and I understand that. So, you know, Definitely. every single business is a tragedy. Uh, I understand that, and I will take it back to government, and we will see if there's any additional support can be given to the wedding industry. Thank you, Sir Geoffrey. Can I just ask that there's quite a clear map um, from the events industry of suggestions. Is it, Danny, do you want to pop in? Because there's some really clear requests that may help define this conversation with government. Um, and we need to start getting that route map. So Danny, do you want to just give that clear instruction? We know that nobody's going to get bailed out and there's not pots of money going to hit us right this minute, but we need that route map. So Danny, do you want to quickly go through that route map? Yeah, I'm very happy to follow this up swiftly on email, Sir, uh, Sir Jeffrey. But yeah. um, fundamentally, Please. I think you, you very kindly listened to all of us and our, our histories, but we're really keen to talk about what can be done in the future, solutions, how to get us back to work. And there are a, a few really key logical things that could be looked at, like increasing guest numbers in venues based on capacity. 15 people in a large country house is, is ridiculous when um, there's so much space for people to operate safely. Um, a roadmap for reopening so that we can talk to consumers about when things are likely subject to other things being in place. And insurance schemes which would give consumers and businesses more confidence because there are the, the, the issues are on both sides of this this industry that we all we all lack the confidence to proceed unless we either have better support from insurers or government backing when insurance fails because we've been in in a sudden lockdown or um, a tier has changed um, I mean I think those those sort of summarize a, a few of the key points as I say I'd be pleased to put them in writing because all of us are keen not just to moan about the past and we realize that efforts are being made but to bring solutions for the future that will make us able to operate and stand on our own two feet so we don't need support. 
Danny, that is fantastic. Clifton Brown G at parliament.uk, no commas, dots, hyphens, or anything else. Yeah. Lowercase, Clifton Brown G, all lowercase, at parliament.uk. There's no co's or comms in it. Any of you, please get in touch with me. I'm more than happy to, to, for that. But Danny, that would be really, really helpful. And then I will make a submission to the Chancellor based on that. Thank, thank you, you so much. So, so, Jeffrey, thank you for joining us today. Appreciate it. That's very, I'm sorry to be rushing off, but I tell you, I can't tell you how many of these Zoom calls I've done since March. It's just unbelievable. But everybody has my huge sympathies and whatever you can, um, try and uh, just have a little bit of time off and enjoy Christmas at least in the best way you can. And um, hopefully think about next year. As somebody had this wonderful phrase, if you think you can do it, you, you, you decide to do it, you can do it. So next year, let's hope that next year brings some better cheer, uh, but don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. That's very great. Happy Christmas, everybody. And you. Thank you. Thank you. So D Dawn is still here as well. Dawn? I think Dawn is still here. She turns up a uh, uh, sound. Uh, I would like to... I, before, um... So, Dawn, are you still so, OK to hang on for a bit? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to have to speak fairly soon because of the next meeting that I've got, if that's OK with you. OK, let me just go to... I didn't want to miss anybody out. Thanks, by the way, Danny and Tali for grabbing in there. I didn't realise you'd finished at 12, so you did a great a great job um, of, of, of grabbing Sir Geoffrey before he, before he left. Very quickly, um, my, my iPhone's gone. I've missed two people out, and uh, I don't know who they are at the top of my head. Danny, can you help me out? The last two on the list. Yeah, uh, we, we'd like to hear from um, Faye Hughes and uh, Richard Parsons, I think. Wave, wave if there's anyone else, but I okay. think those are the two. Great. Faye, can we have your story, please? And then, uh, you know, I'm conscious of time. I'm sorry to rush you as well, but I think it's important that you you have your say. Yeah, I'll try and keep it brief. Um, hello, and thanks for having me on the call. Um, I can look at this from multiple angles, but I'm going to try and be concise. Um, I am a 2020 bride, I manage a venue and I also work with um, and for many of the people on the call today as a freelance self-employed sort of events doer, I think is the best way to put it. Um, and so all of the different um, sort of angles of, that everyone's mentioned today have been um, really prominent. Um, just to speak really from a venue perspective, because I don't think that's quite been covered, um, we've moved over sort of 50 weddings um, at the moment. Um, obviously, it's not just the 2020 brides we're now dealing with. We're dealing with the 2021 couples and the 2022 couples who have hugely lost confidence. Um, and there's nothing that I can do really to, to give them the confidence because I don't know any more than they do um, in terms of how things are um, going to move forward. And that's where the roadmap that Danny mentioned is so important. Um, Ultimately, the what the insurers and the CMA have done, I know um, Jesse spoke about this, but what they have done is pitted the venues against the couples. And um, that then means that you're really damaging the relationship um, when we are supposed to be part and, you know, a really central part of the happiest day of their lives. Um, they're spending huge amounts of money with us. Um, but all of that money isn't just to create the, the day on the day. And what we have found is that the insurers and the CMA just don't seem to understand our industry um, at all. And um, it's been made really difficult from the fact that um, things like maintenance of our grounds, um, which we're a farm, so we don't always look tip top. Um, everything we do is kind of um, responsive to the fact that we have the, the events coming up, um, but it takes a huge amount of work. And that's been told to us that that's not irrecoverable costs. Um, because it's more general than being than being wedding specific. Um, we we have found that um, sort of the the ecosystem thing is really important. We're a, a dry hire venue, so um, a few of the people on the call today have worked at, at Oxley's where I work, um, and we we have found that the the confidence that um, the suppliers have in the way that we are handling things. Um, is being challenged as well because we seem to set the precedence for everybody else. Um, if we allow couples in, for example, July 2021 to move their weddings now because they're unsure that they're going to have the wedding that they planned, um, then that then has a knock-on effect to all of the individual suppliers who then have to give up those prime dates, like um, somebody said earlier, later in the year. 
Um, so it's just this, this whole knock on effect and it just feels like we're all being challenged sort of internally against each other rather than being able to um, to have any support at all. Um, but but you know the the way that the the insurers um, uh, are handling this. I'm going through an insurance claim for my own wedding, which took place with five people. Um, I'm being punished for the fact that for me it was about the wedding and not necessarily about the party in the end. Um, I'm eight months on and still not having a successful claim. And um, I, I, I just think um, that there needs to be some serious investigation into way, the way that that's being handled. Thank you very much, Blaine. I'm sorry I left you late because you were the first person that came on as well. You said <laughs> hello to me. <laughs> Richard. Not my bread in the end. <laughs> Richard, uh, can we bring you in, please? Because you haven't had a chance to. Yeah, talk. sure. Hi, hi, Mark. Hi, everyone. Uh, so. If you don't know me, I'm a professional magician. I've got a limited company and I've been going for about 10 years. Uh, I normally perform at about 100 weddings a year at least. And this year I've performed at three. Uh, I've lost about £40,000 in income at least. Um, and there are, there are a couple of, only really two things that I wanted to raise. Um, Jesse, I think, touched on this. Um, I don't think venues have been really given enough chance to prove that they that they can be COVID compliant and very safe. I'm, I'm very fortunate being a magician that I, I know pretty much every venue in Gloucestershire. Um, some of them I, you know, I go to almost every week. And that they're, you know, they're often massive open spaces, huge barns um, that can very easily socially distance people far better than, than say, a pub or a restaurant. You know, there's, there's often tremendous amounts of space. So, I, and, and also the 30 people at weddings was only um, present for two weeks before it reduced to 15. So I don't think venues have been given the same opportunity as pubs to be able to prove that, you know, we can safely... Uh, provide weddings and, and what that means is that if, if they can do that and we can provide data to show that weddings are safe that will then release more and more numbers but by not being able to prove that weddings are or could be safe um, they just stay locked down at, at 15 but you know I, I can think of so many venues that could easily accommodate far more than 15 but safely with plenty of space you know, I know Oxley's Barn, for example, you know, it's, it's a massive venue, um, lots of space. So that, that was the first thing that I don't think venues have been given a chance, unlike, you know, pubs and restaurants, to be able to show that, you know, we can deal with more than 15 people, we can do 30, we can do 50, for example. So that, I think that's really important. Um, and the other thing, I, th I think somebody touched on this, the one thing that's unique about weddings is that people book us 12 or 18 months in advance. And I can't think of many other uh, careers or jobs where, where that happens. We, we are booked many, many months in advance. So moving things isn't that simple. Um, and I think one thing that the government could do that would help inspire con consumer confidence is to at least show us how they're gonna get um, the numbers of weddings up. Now, I know that might change, but for example, if they if they said, we're, we're aiming to have weddings at 30 by March and 50 by July, then at least we've got a target. But at the moment, with no target at all, um, we don't know whether 15 people will turn into 100 or 15 people will turn into 30. Um, and what I found that's impacted me greatly, I, I rely on deposits and new inquiries to keep my cash flow going. Um, I would normally get inquiries every single day, pretty much throughout the year. Um, I think I've had one inquiry in two months about a, a future wedding, a new booking. And I think that's because nobody knows what on earth is going to happen next year. We, we've not been reassured that, you know, after 15 people, we are hoping to go to this number. We are hope I mean, statistically, I, I checked. Um, the average uh, size of a wedding in the UK is 78 people. That's the average size. So to be able to have some kind of plan over the next few months of how are the numbers going to increase, I think that would inspire confidence 
in brides and grooms. I think that would inspire confidence with new bookings. If we know that by July, we're hoping to have 100 people back, that would cover most weddings. Um, but at the moment, we just have absolutely no idea what's going to happen next year. And of course, quite rightly, who on earth would book anything new in the diary when they don't know what's going to happen? So those would be my two points. Thank you very much, Richard. I think it needs, a, sorry, it needs, a, it needs a little bit of magic, doesn't it, really? I wish. I know. Dawn, can I turn over to you? Thanks ever so much for being so patient today and really no appreciate it. Uh, for those that don't know, Dawn is a leader, of, uh, is a city council uh, councillor for Gloucester City, um, who I know very well. Dawn, what's your thoughts, please? Well, um, firstly, um, having um, I was I'm an entrepreneur and I built a business up from scratch and I cannot tell you how much I feel for you all today. And in a very sort of non-political way, in a very personal way, because I know exactly what it feels like. I know how hard you have to work and um, it's devastating, really devastating. My daughter also like Julie she hadn't finished her degree in event management she was doing that in Bristol um, but she's just given up now come home because she feels what's the point and her father is a exhibition organizer who organizes some of the largest exhibitions in the country and they as you all know have been hit um, dramatically um, the first thing I'd like to say really is that I think uh, the way in which directors' dividends have been treated um, and missed out by the grants and financial assistance uh, packages is deeply disappointing. I mean, so many built businesses are built up like, like that, where you literally will pay yourself what you can afford to pay yourself. You know, I'm not sure how anyone making these decisions can think that isn't how a business is built. You know, you don't start a business and pay yourself two and a half grand a month. It just isn't the way that it works. So um, it, as far as I'm concerned, it's a completely unacceptable black hole at the moment and one that really urgently needs to be plugged because there are hundreds of thousands of you throughout this country in exactly the same position across many, many sectors. So that's the first one. Um, the second one I'd like to say, most of you probably know about this, but there was a petition earlier this year which was sent to central government saying that support was urgently needed the events industry and it gained 154,000 signatures of which quite a few were from Gloucestershire but I was absolutely disgusted when I watched that debate because you would not have believed how few MPs actually turned up to watch it. It was just under two hours um, and those that went spoke well but yes I, I was really really disappointed by that. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, in addition to you guys that are there, you're great innovators, you invent, you know, create these fabulous events and, and the extra little bits you bring to that sort of with your candy floss stalls or your great big wheels that you drag along. So it's all very magical. You know, the other guys that have been missed out in all of this are the showmen, many of which you guys use. And their industry has been absolutely devastated by it and I've lost count of how many weddings I've been to where they have those fabulous you know bacon sarnies and stuff at three o'clock in the morning or Catherine wheels and things um I wish there was something I could do I wish I was an MP rather than a local politician I can I can assure you Mark knows me well enough to know that I wouldn't be knocking on doors I would be kicking them down at the moment because um every single one of you deserves to have a voice and I literally, I pray with all my heart that Jeffrey takes everything on board, you said today, and he goes straight back into central government and he fights for you. I think he will, but I hope he does with all my heart because you all deserve it. And for all those people that aren't on this call today, sitting in their farmhouse or sitting in their cottage, wherever they are, thinking how the hell are they going to pay the next time their car needs MOTing, even the most basic things that people within your industry can't afford at the moment. So, I mean, you know, my, I'm, I'm available 24 seven. I'm, I'm, you're probably not from my area, but if you need, you know, someone to talk to um, for what it's worth, I'm here. And you should be really proud of yourselves. You should be really proud of the fact that you're still sitting there because so many people 
and, and they couldn't help it, but they've already had to give up in your industry. So, you know, I take my hat off to all of you for your resilience. In all my years of being an entrepreneur and running a business, I never ever had to go through what you're all experiencing now. So um, it's, an, it's been an honor actually to be here and to listen to you. Thank you ever so much, Dawn. I know you know Richard Graham really well as I do, and I keep lobbying him and Mark uh, and Alex Kell, and uh, Alex Kell, Alex, Alex Chalk, um, Alex Chalk, as much as possible. And I've been going on and on about this limited company liability, and uh, we've got to keep pushing that because also, we have. We are the entrepreneurs, you know, and we tend, tend to be. Don't want to get political, but we tend to be uh, conservative, you know. Don't say that all of us are, but I'm just saying. And of course, they'll want you. They'll want you back sometime or other in the future. They want your business. They want your money. They want your tax. I think. I think the other thing here, Mark, which is really important, is I think we all know this from when we're growing up. Although there's some very young people here today, so I feel like a geriatric. But everybody whether they're at uni or you're at art school or whatever it is you're doing what are you doing at the weekends you're working in a pub you're working at a wedding as a waitress because you can actually get more money than you can if you work in a pub you know you're helping your friend's mum out doing her floristry for a for a wedding or indeed you've got a broom in your hand and you're helping your local farmer clean out his barn and he's paying you know in those days my day cash in hand to help clear up for some fabulous wedding that's going to take place i mean your industry employs so many people that aren't seen yeah it must touch pretty much every family i would have said in the country and i think that is the ideal and perfect way to end a day so this is a punchline talk so I'd just like to thank you all for joining us and uh be safe and hopefully we'll see you all very soon bye-bye